Hi there. In this half, I'm going to be talking about ways you can increase the scale of your encoding throughput and offer suggestions for ways to troubleshoot problems you may encounter while we're all cooked encoding. So let's jump straight in. Uh, it may not be your intention to automate raw cooked. And if your throughput is a small manageable amount of 2K files, such as Michael described, but if you've started working with 4K, you may appreciate the frustration of moving, copying, or encoding these DPX sequences and prefer to have a few tricks up your sleeve. So automation can run a very simple repetitive task, or it can completely remove the need for human interaction by providing enough logic to check results of actions throughout the workflow. At either level, it helps make your workflow scalable. We'll take a look at ways to optimize your throughput, including the secret source, parallel encoding. We will look briefly at BFI shell scripts and the raw cooked encoding commands we use. We'll discuss capturing log outputs and why that's so important. And finally, discuss a few different automation methods to help you get started right away. The image shows, by the way, <laughs> the image shows some of the BFI's 2K raw cooked encodings, including the optical audio soundtracks from the Socialism on Film collection recently digitised, which I love. So parallelization is the act of processing jobs in parallel, using resources to process jobs in less time by dividing up the work. Normally, a computer processes jobs serially, so one job after another. When optimised for parallel processing, a server will complete a series of raw cooked jobs far quicker than if left to work through them serially. The more CPU cores you have, that's central processing unit cores, which control inter interpretation and execution of instructions, then the more parallelization you'll be possible with your um, will be possible with your encoding. Parallelization is not the same as multi-threading, which you may have heard of. Multi-threading is used by FFmpeg for encoding and decoding FFv1. You may already know that FFv1 codec, codec has slices through each frame, which allow for granular checksum verification of the asset. But it also allows FFmpeg multi-threading, as each slice block could be separated into different processing tasks. How efficient your multi how efficient your multithreading can make your computer or server will vary based on this sliced based multithreading and again the CPU core count. Multithreading on a single CPU will give the illusion of jobs running in parallel, but it's a scheduling algorithm that switches depending on read write input interruptions and thread priorities. Multithreading on a multiple CPU core computer will allow for true parallelization because the more cores you have, the more parallel processes you can run, giving optimum efficiency. Another factor that will help raw cooked encoding and parallelization is your storage type and whether the read and write speeds complement the CPU capacity. It's felt that faster encoding comes with a DPX sequence is sourced from a separate SSD or network storage with a read write, or you may see it IO, speed that the CPU can handle. Finally, RAM, random access memory, is required to bridge any gaps that may appear with bottlenecks between read and write interrupts and the CPU processing. It's important to have a good chunk available. Um, at this point, I would recommend having a look at the media area GitHub raw cooked issue 375, which has a much fuller explanation um, and it's very recently been posted online. It's really great. So at the BFI, we use a 32 core server, which has 64 threads. It also has 252 gigabyte, gigabytes of RAM and network storage, which sends and receives across a 40 gigabit Ethernet connection. We found this allows approximately 20 parallel 4K raw cook jobs to run, amongst other non-encoding script processes. And it virtually always keeps it near to full capacity when all 20 are going at once. It's worth noting that there's currently no support for accelerated graphics processing units, that's GPU, um, for encoding or decoding with FFV1 codec. But there are plans to develop this support in the future. If you're not sure what your current server's RAM or threads are, then you can use HTOP. This HTOP window from our raw cook server shows thread counts, which are in the top 64. Um, RAM, which you can see on the left hand side there where it says memory, 252G. And multi-threading processes, which are shown at the bottom in green. 
this is quite a quiet encoding day really um there are 27 jobs running but you can see that the threads aren't at max capacity they're all fairly low um, if you want to see how fast your network communications are for your NAS storage, you could use software like Iftop, IFTOP for Mac and Linux, or NetHogs for Windows, which is N-E-T-H-O-G-S. So at the BFI, we use open source software GNU Parallel, which adds an extra layer of parallelization. It separates encoding jobs across CPU cores, maintaining maximum CPU and IO activity at all times on the server. It's free software to download and use, but requires installation, and there are lots of guides online to help you do that. Most simply, you can input a list of DPX sequences and set a number of parallel jobs, then pass your raw cook command and, jobs with, and your jobs will be processed with that command at the same time. The example above shows the cat command, which lists each item in the text file. Then the vertical line, which is called a pipe, hands each item from the list to parallels in one, one lump. Parallel then takes 10 jobs at a time and launches the raw cook command with the curly brackets representing each individual path from the list. If you're unsure how many jobs your server, your server can handle, then you can use the max jobs flag along with the load flag, which lets you set a range of performance restrictions, including maximum CPU usage, maximum free memory, or a maximum IO limit. This is really helpful if you have any one of these as a limitation in your workflow. It will prevent encoding jobs crashing because any one of these excesses could overload your system. It will also map job progress, including providing a list of completed jobs so far. And once you've installed GNU Parallel, you can access the manual by typing man parallel, where you can read more about all these instructions. Two more of note though, um, show you how many cores and how many CPUs your, ser your server has available to you, which is really helpful when you're setting up your GNU Parallel workflow. For any Windows 10 users, you can install Parallels, though I've not tried this. To do it, you need to install first git bash, which is um, enabled by the Windows subsystem for Linux feature. There are loads of great installation guides online, though, to get you started. So as an aside, I thought it would be useful to illustrate the frames per second difference for an RGB 4K sequence on the top half and frames per second average of 5.7 for an RGB 2K sequence in the bottom half. Um, as you can see, it's frames per second is 0.6 for the 4K and it's roughly 5.7 for the 2K. A 4K film at 24 frames per second, that's 12 minutes long, so there's roughly 17,200 DPX images, can take up to 15 hours to encode when there are just three parallel encodings running on our server. So for this alone, parallelization is critical to workflows at the BFI National Archive. So I thought it could be helpful to talk through a few steps for workflow planning and how you might want to integrate other media area tools to help in the preparation and checking of data as part of that workflow. You want to set up a test environment to test your automations. This can simply be a folder located safely away from your preservation storage. In here, you can work on backed up copies of DPX sequences, or you can generate your own sequences using FFmpeg's generative lav fee filter. The command shown here is um, will generate a quick two kilobyte RGB sequence using test source bars. It will make 240 images named sequentially dpx underscore 0000.dpx through to 239.dpx. If you are receiving externally scanned films, you may encounter variability in your DPX metadata. And for that, Media Area have wonderful partner software to Raw Cooked. So let's have a look. Led by Jerome Martinez, Media Area comprises a consortium of talented developers and archivists producing audiovisual tools with preservation interests at core. As well as Raw Cooked, their tools include Media Conch, for AV file standard conformance checking and media info to view and interrogate file metadata. They're very easy to download following instructions provided at mediaarea.net where it tells you what to download for your operating system. 
If you prefer, you can use package managers such as Homebrew for Mac and Linux or Chocolatey for Windows to install the software. In case you already have Media Info and Media Conch installed, it might be worth checking which versions you have, as releases between version 19 and the latest version 22 weren't able to handle 4K DPX files due to an image file size limitation. So it's worth checking your setup. This is an example policy used at the BFI, which checks an incoming DPX for a few different things, including basic metadata requirements for the BFI raw code license and certain requirements for FFmpeg operability. Each policy block is broken into rules and the rules manage the type of data that is acceptable to receive. These can be AND or rules, so you can allow choices between two types of files, such as bit def can be 10 or 16 bit, color space, can be Luma Y or RGB, um, and no type of alpha channel is present as we don't have alpha support in the BFI licenses. This specific policy is available to view at Media Areas Media Conch website under the Public Policies, and the Media Conch online website is the best place to have a go at writing your own policy before you turn your hand to XML creation like the example showing. It's a lot to learn in one hit, so I recommend exporting a couple of public policies and adapting those first, such as this one. Once installed, it's very easier to use Media Info and Media Conch from the command line. You just call the software first in the command Media Info and the path for the first DPX within the sequence. If you want a more detailed command, you can add the F-F in between the, the name Media Info and the file name, and that will return a full output of all the metadata available to Media Info. Media Conch um, will need a written policy, such as the one, the public policies that we just looked at. Then you will call the software Media Conch, followed by the P flag to tell the software that the item following is the XML policy you want to use, then finish with the path to the first DPX in the sequence. The software will then return a pass or fail statement. If it fails, then you will get a list of the items that failed in the policy, which is often best read from the bottom up, uh, particularly if policies have nested checks in them. So let's take a quick look at the BFI's raw cooked encoding scripts, starting with a quick tour of the GitHub page address at the bottom. At the BFI National Archive, much of the software we're building uses open source tools and languages. Because of this, it's so important to me that we share these scripts that are built. Um, the only way the only way tooling like Raw Cooked can remain sustained for the long-term preservation future of our assets is if we build a larger user base by sharing knowledge and projects. You can find all the code here, along with detailed documentation about how we've configured the scripts to run on our Linux servers. Today we're just going to focus on two of the scripts, our Raw Cooked script and our Post Raw Cooked analysis script. So the Raw Cooked script is written in Bash shell. It's launched continually throughout the day with no more than one instance of the script operation running at any one time, meaning as soon as one ends, another starts again. Its main task is to check a watch folder for new DPX sequences moving into it. It then finds available sequence paths, sorts them into ascending numerical order, and checks if any items have already been processed from the current encoding list. If not being processed already, then the first 20 are sorted and passed to the GNU parallel, which runs multiple concurrent raw cooked encodings. When these 20 are completed, the script restarts the process all over again. For each raw cooked encoding, the script also generates a log file, which is critical to the next stage. Although there are only 100 lines of code, 18 of them control the raw cooked encoding command. The coding process begins at line 76, where a find command looks in the watch folder named DPX path for directories and with the name starting n underscore. This finds the DPX sequence at the top level of the folder, not contents of the directories within folders specified by the minimum and max depth flags, and returns the whole path to that folder. Each path is then passed into a while loop, one at a time, which completes the commands intended below. Line 77 to 84 extracts the file name from the path and checks if the file name is already listed as previously cooked or queued for cook. These lists are created at other stages in the workflow. 
If not on either list, the folders are written to a temporary raw cook list.txt. Otherwise, no action is taken and the DPX sequence is not added to any lists. On line 87 to 90, um, this list is read, sorted, and the first 20 items are passed to a new raw cook list.txt. And this list is also output to a raw cooked encoding script log. Line 93 takes the new raw cook list text, reads it and pipes it to parallel. The cat command opens the list contents, then the pipeline passes the list to parallel all at once, which runs two parallel jobs using the command that follows beginning with raw cooked. This ensures two parallel encodings run, both outputting to unique file names with individual log files alongside. We do run this few jobs on parallels when we have multiple storage devices encoding from one server. Currently, this is the case with our business as usual 4K encodings, where there can be up to five storage devices working at any one time. So here's the raw cook command we're using for this encoding. Raw cooked calls the software to launch. Dash Y answers yes to any and all questions Royal Cook might ask in the console. Um, you can substitute this for dash N if you don't want to, it to answer yes to all the questions. Dash dash all, the wonderful all command as described by Michael earlier. Dash dash no except gaps. Uh, adds a warning to the logs to ensure that we know that gaps have been found. S dash s and then that number sets the maximum allowable attachment size to five megabytes otherwise it will default to one megabyte which is too small for some of our file attachments next is the path to the dpx folder you want to encode dash o sets the output path and file name desired for the encoded ffe1 matroska otherwise it will default set um, it will default to putting the mkv file alongside the dpx sequence and last but not least, the two right arrows and the text log um, outputs all the console standard out for the encoding and copies them to a log path. The same path as the MKV, but with a dot text at the end of the name. This is a very important stage for our automation scripts, as we use these logs to inform cleanup actions with the FFE1 Matroska files. So let's take a look at one of our 2K capture log files. It begins with pre-encoding analysis before FFmpeg launches now, uh, having received the encoding command from Raw Cooked. It encodes the DPX sequences into an FFE1 Matroska before the post-encode analysis begins to check the FFE1 Matroska contents perfectly match the source DPX sequence. You can see the successful completion, completion statement at the end there, reversibility was checked, no issues detected. So why would we want to keep this? For each recording, this gives us a permanent record of the raw cooked and FFmpeg encoding process. This includes any successful completion statements, as you can see, or warnings and errors that might occur due to DPX file anomalies. They also contain critical file details about the software versions used to encode, encode the file, paths to and from the file destinations, and all the encoding data processed by FFmpeg. It's possible future versions of FFmpeg or raw cooked may not be backward compatible with preserved FFE1 Matroska files, and you may want to have that detail stored on file so that it's easily imported to a database, for example, for future reference. The FFE1 Matroska files we create from our 4K film scans tend to have bit rates over 8,000 megabits a second, which makes them impossible to view by playing in open source tools like MPV or VLC. So you really do need rigorous post-encoding checks that assess these encoding logs. So here are a few examples from my collection of DPX sequence info warning and error messages. The first message at the top, uh, you will get that if you try to encode a raw cooked flavour you don't have covered by a raw cooked licence. The second is the warning you may receive letting you know your DPX files have non-zero padding bits and it advise, advises you to re-encode them with the check padding flag instead of the check flag. The all command handles this differentiation now though, so if you wish to avoid seeing this log, use the all command. 
The third was a warning we were receiving for a while um, that was found to be raw cook reversibility data truncated during the encoding process by FFmpeg. You're unlikely to ever see this type of message, but it's helpful to give a sense of what you of what can happen if you have one of those mystery DPX files. So our second BFI post raw cooked encoding script uses these logs to automate success and fail workflows. Here is our post raw cook shell script, which checks the FFV1 Matroska file and the raw cook logs to assess for success. First, the FFV1 Matroska file is tested against a media crunch policy. If it fails, it's moved to a deletion folder and the log is moved to a log folder, prepended failed. If it, if it passes, then the log is searched for three types of messages. Successful encoding message, so reversibility was checked, no issue detected, which we saw earlier. This triggers actions against the DPX sequence, moving it to a completed folder to avoid re-encoding, and moving the FFV1 to a check folder where the check function assesses the health of the file. Two looks for an error warning that the reversibility file is becoming too big. This means the file needs re-encoding with the output version 2 flag, which you'll hear a bit more about later. And the DPX sequence path is added to a list for files that require this re-encoding. And number three, we look for generic error messages such as conversion failed or error reversibility was checked, issues detected, see below. When these are found, the FFV1 Matroska is deleted and the log is prepended failed and moved again to the logs folder. This allows for a normal re-encoding attempt. So I hope you can see how capturing these logs will help with future workflow generation and preservation knowledge. So I recognise these scripts are a lot to take in. So here are a few simple automation methods you could try now that will automate the actions against a folder full of DPX test sequences. The for loop is very powerful, so do create a test folder for these experiments. First, you need to change directory into your test folder containing all of your DPX sequences. You do this using CD and then adding your directory path afterwards. Once inside, you can type the for loop, naming a variable name dir, dir, that will form the folder path of the found DPX sequences within the folder you are in, indicated using the star and the forward slash. The next section, do, lists the raw cooked command we should recognise from before, where the the dir with a dollar sign in front of it becomes the folder path and name, but the mkv will get created alongside the dir with the mkv extension on the end, and the log with the mkv.txt extension. So instead of going to a separate file, they'll be included within the same file because you're just using that standard uh, path. Semicolons are, and done signal the end of the loop once all of the items have been found and worked against. The recursive find loop you should recognise from the scripts we looked at earlier. You don't need to change directories to use this one, but you do need to accurately specify the path to your directory containing all the DPX sequence folders. The find loop will look for type D, meaning directories within this path. If you would put type F, it would just bring out file types. Uh, and it's also looking for them to start with the name N underscore. When found, the exec call tells the find loop to execute the following raw cook command. And the curly brackets represent the path name um, to the found DPX sequences in this example. And so as in with the for loop, you can add the .mkv and the .mkv.txt to the FFV1 and the log respectively. Again, the backslash um, represents the end of the loop and the semicolon as well. Um, and this will enact once all of the loops are completed. So neither of these two commands use parallelization, um, as in job parallels using the GNU parallels, but they will save you from, they will save you operator time starting and stopping processes. So with two commands, though, you can use GNU parallels without writing a script. If you use the recursive find loop to create a list full of paths to the DPX sequences, um, that would be your first line of code. Then if you cat that list and pipe it to GNU parallels and set your number of jobs and supply your preferred raw cook command, then you can have parallelization um, on a manual basis. 
And don't forget to get your logs as well for each. I'm a big fan of logs. So please don't forget to test everything in a safe environment before running these commands against preservation files. That's so important. It would be awful if you were to use these against preservation files and find out there's a little error in your code in some way. So if you want to dig deeper, um, then here are a few projects that might give you some clues about workflow generation. Again, you can view the code we talked about today from our open source GitHub page for the National Archive Data and Digital Preservation Department. Here the repository DPX encoding has all our code and a detailed readme which describes all the actions of the shell and Python scripts included within. It's regularly updated as this is our live code, so don't be surprised if things change as the workflows evolve. Um, another great script um, is Kieran O'Leary's IFI scripts. They were a massive inspiration to me and ignited my use of raw cooked for DPX encoding in 2008, particularly this script that's shown here, sequence to FFE1 or seq to ffv1.py. This code is dense and complex if you're new to Python, and it uses the subprocess module to pass the raw cook command and encode the file. It's not using any kind of parallelization, um, but it has a wonderful feature that encodes the first 24 frames of DPX sequence and then reversibility tests them, only progressing to encode the whole sequence if this first test, com is, if this first test completes OK. I plan on writing our own BFI Python raw cook scripts in the not too distant future and I'll be borrowing this enviable test for all future encoding. And also delving into Python multiprocessing as an alternative to GNU Parallel. I just learned about this little shell project recently. Um, it's a little bit of code being written by UK MACE archive technician Alex Habgood. It's called DPX Crunch. Um, it's a bash shell script in development, so watch this space for docs. I think he's hoping it will be a user friendly piece of software that can be implemented straightforward into lots of different archives. So here's a few web links to help you with writing shell scripts or learning and writing Python. So let's have a little break. And if there are any questions, please fire away. <laughs>